It was a number of weeks ago that we started an adventure looking at the men and the women who are listed in Hebrews chapter 11. Now, if you've been with us the last number of weeks, you know that uh, this title, this section of verses, is normally referred to as the men and women who are heroes of the faith. And each week we have gathered together and we have worshiped and we have gleaned from the lives of these individuals, but we've started with the jumping point of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. And I want to invite you if you have your passages of scripture there handy, uh, your Bible, your sword, or maybe you've got your phone or a computer sitting there, you can go to uh, different Bible apps, whatever you prefer, to follow along with us. I'll try to have some of these verses also on the screen so you can see them. But this has been our jumping point each and every week as we try to ground ourselves back to this issue of faith and the faith that was modeled for us by these individuals in Hebrews chapter 11 so that we can each be men and women of faith. And this is what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. And by faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of the things which are visible. Now, each week, we attempted to look at the examples of how this verse connects with the reality that we face And we have challenged ourselves uh, to practice faith like this in a number of ways that even though we can't see or know exactly what's under what's happening, we understand that God is the authority, he is in control. And just as he created the worlds that we know today from the word of his mouth, uh, we know that we can have faith to follow him and we can trust in him, even though we can't see all that is happening. And we've looked at a number of different examples. We've tried to connect it uh, to illustrations like when you walk across the floor, especially if it's a suspended floor. There is an element of faith that we are practicing. We believe, we have faith that that floor, that subfloor, all of the foundations is going to carry our weight and we won't fall into the pit that is below. When we come to a light switch, we practice a bit of faith, really. We come to that light switch, we flip the switch, and we expect something to happen. We believe that something will happen. We believe that the lights will turn on. And when you go and get in your vehicle, you put the key in the ignition, and you have faith that when you turn that key, the car is going to start. Unless your car has proven unreliable, and then You might call that a miracle, but I'm thankful to know that God is a faithful and a dependable God. He might not be like that undependable car. Our Father, our God, is a faithful God, and we can trust Him, and we can have faith in Him, and He has called us to exhibit that faithfulness uh, towards Him. Now, we've seen a number of examples as we've journeyed through Hebrews chapter 11, Uh, We looked at uh, Abel and how he worshiped with a pure heart, and God approved of him. And we looked at Enoch and how he walked with God and how it was described of him as a man who God said, uh, I accredit you with uh, faithfulness. And he uh, he didn't have to uh, experience death, Enoch didn't, because of his, his faith and how he walked with God. Then we looked at Noah a man who believed, who had faith that God would bring judgment up for the sin that he saw in the world, but that also Noah believed and had faith in God for a plan of salvation, that he would save him and his family. And so he took action and he built an ark and he obeyed in faith. And then we looked at Abraham's beginnings and how God called him to go to a land that he did not yet know by faith, trusting in God. And he left what was comfortable, and he set out on the journey that God had called him to. And then we looked at uh, Abraham's wife, Sarah, who, yes, at first did laugh at the idea that she would have a child in her old age. But as a result of her faith in God and his ability to bring it to completion, uh, she uh, experienced 
a child. And we learn the lessons that God had taught us through that experience when he spoke, is anything too hard for the Lord God? And we know that answer to be no. Uh, There is nothing too difficult for the Lord our God to accomplish. And then we turned our attention to Isaac. Some would call him the son of promise, the son of promise to Abraham and Sarah. And he would speak blessings to his son and he would impress upon us the importance of not only being a man or a woman of faith, but also a man and a woman who would pass on our faith to the next generation. Then we looked at Isaac's son, Jacob, and how uh, in, the, in Hebrews chapter 11, it described that when he was dying, he leaned over his staff and he continued to worship the Lord God. And he was faithful to the end, worshiping to the end. Then we dove into the life of Joseph, one of Jacob's son. And while Joseph does paint for us uh, a pretty extensive uh, set of examples of maybe why Joseph would be listed in Hebrews chapter 11. The writer of Hebrews points us to Joseph's words of hope that would speak of the people, the Israelites' deliverance long before they ever knew that they needed to be delivered. Joseph spoke of deliverance, and we learn that God is faithful long before we realize, before we acknowledge and know and understand that he is faithful. And so then the person who God used to deliver them from the hand of uh, Pharaoh was a man by the name of Moses. Like Joseph, Moses had quite a bit of content. He got a pretty large script. There's lots of content that we can draw from when we look at Moses' life as a man of faith. But what we looked at and what we found when we studied Hebrews chapter 11 directly with those verses and Moses, we learn that faith puts us in direct conflict with the worldly standards. And faith forces us to fear God more than man. And faith leads us to action. And while fear stops us just like they had stopped at the Red Sea, while fear may stop us, faith should move us. And then last week, last week we looked at Joshua. Moses' predecessor, and he was able to experience the promise that was spoken of entering into the promised land long before. And early on in his leadership stint, Joshua was asked to do something that at the time did not make a lot of sense. He was called to march around the wall of Jericho, the walls of Jericho, blow trumpets and shout and see that the walls would fall down. We challenged, as we looked at that, each of us, uh, to follow through on matters of faith, find the walls that we have built up, that we see as insurmountable, and to have faith in God to deliver and to begin the process of tearing down those walls. And so we saw that Joshua followed through in his faith when God called him to take action. And God was faithful in return, and Joshua and the Israelites were able to experience victory. Which leads us to our time together today. Because within the story of Joshua, we mentioned her just briefly last week, we find another name. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we see this name also listed. Her name was Rahab. And if you remember just a little bit, I want to refresh your memory about what we spoke about Rahab. But before we get too far into her story, I want us to read what the writer of Hebrews states about Rahab. In Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 31, this is what it states. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And that's it. That's, this is what the writer of Hebrews writes about Rahab. One short little verse. And on the surface, this verse might not seem like there's a large amount of faith element really at all within these verses. But this is where it's important for us to look back into history 
and to study and understand what's actually happening when the writer of Hebrews makes this reference. So you might remember from last week that before Joshua had led the Israelites through the Jordan River, he sent spies in to investigate the land and specifically the city of Jericho. That was Joshua chapter 2, verse 1, and we're going to read that in just a little bit, so I want to encourage you to turn there if you uh, have a chance to do that. This time, however, unlike Moses sending 12 spies and getting uh, two back with a favorable result, uh, Joshua sends two spies into the land and to spy out the city of Jericho. Now, those spies, they met a woman in the city of Jericho whose name is Rahab. This is the same woman referenced here in Hebrews chapter 11. And we touched briefly upon her when we studied Joshua last week. Now, what we know about Rahab so far to this point in the biblical account is nothing. We know nothing about Rahab so far. But what we find out about Rahab will likely cause most of us and most people really to question the spy's actions Uh, maybe even her actions, as well as even question possibly God's actions in in, uh, just what he was doing. And so let's read Joshua chapter 2, starting in verse 1 together. And this is what it says. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two, two men secretly from Shatim as spies, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Now, for most good, upstanding, Bible-thumping individuals, this just doesn't sit well. The spies going through the land, that's fine. But finding a place to hide and to seek shelter, sure. But having these men who are people of God go into the house of a prostitute, someone of ill repute, this is where many begin to draw the line. But regardless of your opinion of who God can use or who he won't use or who he will use, it actually will start to make some more sense as we study this section just a little bit more. Now, if you're uh, not from this land or this area and you're spying out this land, you need shelter and rest and you need a place where people aren't paying much attention to. And you need a place that, where people will come and go somewhat frequently. And Rahab fits this need. So someone who might have more than usual traffic would be a woman like Rahab. Now, it's Uh, important to note that some commentators have suggested that Rahab's house was likely a way station, an inn, or a tavern, or a combination of these, and that a prostitute and an innkeeper were actually synonymous or interchangeable terms at this time. The location, as we look at and we'll come to find out, the location of her home is strategic in God's plan. She is likely not a person of great wealth or position. Uh, We spoke last week that the constructions of the walls, where we have the outer wall, and then there's a gap, and then there's that inner wall, uh, there were homes built within that gap, and they positioned themselves up against the wall, and they took up that space. This is likely where Rahab's home was, which as we read this account, uh, later on we'll find that Rahab was able to let the spies escape out of a window to the outside of the city and go into the hills of Judea when the city gates are locked. Now we're not told how long Rahab uh, and the spies spent time together. We don't know the duration of how long the spies were lodged there, but what we do find in the account is that the spies were found out. Uh, News of their origin, news of their purpose, and their suspected place of lodging became known to the king. And in these following verses, we see that the men uh, that were sent by the king, they come to Rahab's house to search them out. And they knock on the door. And they're asking, inquiring of where the two men went. There's been a record found that there were two men here. We want to know where they are. Now, Rahab has a choice. 
she could have easily turned them over. But in verse 4 of Joshua chapter 2, we're told that Rahab hid the two men and then made up a story about how they have gone from there and she doesn't know where they are. But if they would hurry after them, she would be sure that they would be able to follow and capture them. Now, what Rahab did in that moment is considered an act of treason. It's an act of treason against her city slash state, and it carried with it a penalty of death. Rahab was risking a lot. And so while Rahab sent the king's officers off on a wild goose chase, there's still a problem, though. The two men are still in Rahab's house locked inside the city. And this is where Joshua chapter 2, starting in verse 8, becomes an important uh, section of verses that we see happening. There's this dialogue that happens between Rahab and the spies, and I want you to follow along with me in Joshua chapter 2, starting in verse 8. It says this, Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Shihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard of it, our hearts melted And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. There it is. Rahab, this woman whose reputation was that of a prostitute or innkeeper, communicates that God, the God of Israel, he is God in heaven. He is God on the earth. And I want us to pause just for a second there as we reflect on this truth and also potentially reflect on the acceptance of this truth for ourselves. This passage of scripture, this section, it's easy for us to gloss over, to pass over the phrase quickly without truly wrestling with it fully. But I want us to wrestle with this statement that she makes, this confession that she makes. And while most of us here can say even out loud that our faith in this statement is true, that we believe that the Lord our God, He is God in heaven and above and on earth, I want us to wrestle with whether our actions are actually reflecting that truth in our everyday life. Rahab's faith in this statement, in this acknowledgement of God being the one true God in heaven and on earth, led her to an act of treason, where she could have, if found out, been put to death. But because she believed that the God of Israel was the one true God, she acted in accordance with her faith. And I just want us to think about how how God is more important in her life right now than the powerful earthly king that she was currently submitted to and that controlled this little piece of land and what that meant for her. And I want us to consider maybe the little things or big things that we consider in our lives when we think about how they control our actions, how they control our speech. And I want us to think about this. I want to challenge you this week to bring your decisions and bring your actions in line with the truth that God is God in heaven and on earth. There is no other ruler or authority that is more powerful, that can bring upon us either success or destruction. God is God in heaven and on earth. And I want us to think, maybe even this week, look back, reflect. Where has your heart melted 
and fear. I mean, think about it. It says, as soon as we heard of it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. Now think about the situations where your heart has melted. Where your, where your faith and your trust has been challenged. And, and I'm guessing there's plenty of opportunities for us to see this happen. Maybe it's been this last week when you heard the news about COVID-19 and not being able to meet and how serious it can be. Uh, or maybe it's uh, the employment situation or possibly the unemployment situation that has caused your heart to melt in fear and the, the, the unknown has caused your heart to melt in fear. Maybe it's worry over a child in their safety as they go out into a situation or maybe, maybe they themselves have been sick uh, maybe it's a decision as they grow older. You, you're just cons- you're consumed with it. Or, or maybe your heart has melted in fear as you sat down to write out your bills. And you have looked through your finances. Maybe your heart is in fear when your spouse has to be gone long hours from home. Or maybe chooses to be out long hours at home. Where has your heart melted in fear? And then ask your question, where have you turned? Have you turned to the news as the source of hope? Have you turned to the government officials as source of hope? Have you turned to a medical staff as your source of hope? Uh, Maybe a tracking device. Or this truth that God is God in heaven above and on earth. Has it driven you to return to the word of God? And to trust in faith. God is faithful. Now I find it significant in Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. We looked at it last week. It says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And yet if we flip the pages to Joshua chapter 2, verse 9, it says, The fear of you has fallen upon us, and all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. See, the difference between these two verses, courage and fear, comes down to faith in God as God in heaven and on earth, and who we trust in to lead us and to guide us. And yet, let us consider what Rahab had to go on. Rahab had no more to go on than for evidences than these reports that were spread about what God had done with the Israelites and how he delivered them out of the hand of Pharaoh and how he has led them across the wilderness. But even with this limited amount of knowledge and report, Rahab believed, had faith that God is the one true God. And that led Rahab to act. I want us to ask us the question, how much, how much evidence do you need before you'll decide who God is? How much study do you have to engage in before you declare and, and surrender in faith to God and who he is? How much more do you need before you respond and act? The example that we have in Rahab is that in faith, Rahab sided with God, and the decision is the same for us today. Now, as we continue to look at Rahab and and her story, Rahab also had a request. And I think it's a common sense request, and it's an important request. It talks about that she wanted, as we study through that, she wanted the spies to remember the kindness and the faith that she was displaying to them. So that when they did return to the city to take the city, she and her father's household would be spared. And this is the men's response in Joshua chapter two, verse 14. It states this. And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death, if you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Now some, as we read those verses, pass that off as self-preservation 
for Rahab and the spies themselves. However, I don't believe that Rahab committed an act of self-preservation in a moment. I believe that she made a decisive decision to make a lifelong change to surrender and to follow God. And she continued in that faith. And she had the opportunity to continue in that faith. She acted in faith when she tied a scarlet cord to her window. She acted in faith when she gathered her family into her home. And when everything around her was utter chaos and the walls and the city was crumbling down around her, she had faith in the God of heaven and earth. Now, if you remember from last week, the account itself, those walls crumbling down, when the Israelites returned, the walls fell down after they had marched around the city. There is this section on the northern side of the city that is believed to be where Rahab's house was located. And in the 1950s, they did an excavation of that section of the city, and they found uh, along the outer walls, walls that made up homes, uh, little rooms that was likely where uh, Rahab and her family survived the destruction. Because all around, the walls were caving in. But in this area, the walls stood firm. And what is recorded for us in God's word, it expresses to us the faithfulness of God to those who live in faith. As the city walls are falling, falling and the battles ensuing, Joshua states to the two men who had made the agreement with Rahab this. In Joshua chapter 6, verse 22, it says, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. Rahab is a wonderful example of what it means to practice our faith. Because of Rahab's faith in the God of heaven and of earth, she was saved. But not only was she saved, but her household was rescued and saved. And when we study further the heritage of our Savior, we find that through this woman named Rahab, we see in the genealogy of Christ, who ultimately brought about the salvation for us, Rahab's name is mentioned. And, and I believe that when we have faith, the same outcome is also for us, that we can experience deliverance. And salvation. Now, don't misunderstand me here. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I am not talking about fire insurance. What I'm talking about is a faith that is sincere and obedient and leads us into action which continues to deliver us. Because I believe that there is a day coming when all of the world as we know it will also melt away. And whether our physical bodies wear out and succumb to destruction before that happens, or Jesus returns and the world passes away, the Bible declares that those who have faith in Christ will be delivered. Those who have faith in Christ shall be saved. And just as a scarlet cord applied to the window signified uh, that those who would be delivered, so the scarlet blood of Christ applied to our lives will lead to our deliverance also who practice faith. And just as Rahab's name is written in the biblical record as a woman of faith in which Jesus would come to the physical earth, so when Jesus returns, we who have placed our faith in Jesus might find our names written in the book of life and experience the ultimate deliverance. See, this list of heroes, the heroes of our faith, is not just some boring list of names of people from generations long ago, but they are our examples for us of what it means to live by faith. So that when this life comes to an end, we might 
uh, long to hear the, the list of names and celebrate with those who hear their names called to enter into life with Christ. But the question that we must all answer, the question that remains is this, do we have faith? Can we say that we are men and women who practice faith and whose faith fully rests in Jesus Christ? Do we believe in the, that God is the God of heaven and earth? Have we confessed to God and others that he is God in heaven and on earth and that our faith fully lies on, on his power and his authority? Have we made a change? Have we repented of our sins? Have we tied the cord to the window? Have we been baptized, immersed in the waters of baptism, washing away our sins, united with Christ to become a new creation? Have we made those decisions, those actions, based fully in faith and what the Word of God has described for us? Now today, I want to remind us that while we might be separated by a screen, that doesn't stop you from making a decision today. Whatever the decision might be, whether it's a decision to recommit your life to full faith in Christ, or whether it's for the first time declare that I believe that God is God of heaven and of earth, and that God is faithful, and God will deliver if you have a decision to make today, call me right where you're at. Text me, send me an email, contact one of our elders within the church, get a hold of someone today. Talk to someone in your household. Don't let this day pass. We will spend some time. I will come to your house. That doesn't exceed uh, the 10 number rule. But today we wanna provide you an opportunity to make a decision in faith. And we want to encourage you to be men and women of faith, not just today, but as you continue to live each and every day. Now today, as we remember in faith that Christ was sent by his heavenly Father to this earth to pay the penalty for our sins by dying on a cross in our place, we're going to declare together in faith that we believe that God did something that we cannot do, and that's pay for our sins, to meet the need that we have. Today, we're going to declare through communion that this act of death, burial, and resurrection is available to us who believe and in faith surrender our lives to him so that we will experience salvation and deliverance when Christ comes again. And I want to encourage you, if, if you haven't done so already, uh, to go ahead and get the preparations for communion, uh, a piece of bread, uh, some juice, because it's these elements that Jesus uses during a Passover meal. And he tells to his disciples some very important words of instructions. This Passover meal was celebrated every year, and it was a meal set up to remind the people of God of his deliverance of the nation of Israel out of the hand of Egypt and Pharaoh. And yet, while this meal is happening, Jesus takes the elements of the meal and he instituted for us a new reminder who are under the new covenant in Christ. And he says this in Matthew chapter 26. He says, now as they were eating, in verse 26, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. It's with these words Jesus instituted for us a reminder of a new covenant 
that God was establishing through Christ. And as a follower of Jesus, a follower of Christ, a disciple of his, whatever term you want to use there, uh, we invite you to find some grape juice and some unleavened bread. Those were the uh, elements that we believe used within this supper. And if you don't have those elements, feel free to celebrate uh, with a substitute like a cracker or some other juice or water. And there's reasons why I'd love to visit with you about you have, if you have questions. But at this time, whatever you have, we want to encourage you to take and eat the bread, which represents God's body that was broken for us. And we want to encourage you to drink of the cup, the fruit of the vine, in remembrance of Christ's blood that was shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. Remembering that act of grace that Christ has done for us. As you eat and as you drink, remember. Remember the sacrifice, but also remember that God is God of heaven and of earth. And we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear what we face because God is with us. God has given us the ultimate victory, and in the end, with our faith firmly established in him, we know and we proclaim in this act that God will deliver us also. Now, I want to say thank you for joining us in this time of worship, study, and communion. Please stay connected with us, whether it be in an online platform or through a phone call or even just uh, a one-on-one -on -one visit while practicing social distancing. Please remember those that might be in a situation where they are quarantined. Continue to check on your neighbors. Continue to check in on your brothers and sisters in Christ who are part of the body. And if there's any way that we can be of assistance or you know of needs that arise, I pray that the, uh, you'd be able to meet that and that we as a church collectively can meet that. So may you go now and be the church that has left the building. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for our time of worship. Thank you for our time of study. Thank you for this list of names that have recorded for us great displays of faith that have challenged us in our everyday lives to be men and women of faith. Father, help us to be uh, continually effective as you help us to grow in our relationship with you and with others. Help us to be effective in reaching those who are far from you to make known uh, you as God of heaven and earth. Father, thank you for each person joining us whether it be here personally or whether it be online, wherever we may be, whatever time, whatever place. Father, thank you for being a God in heaven who loves us and is always faithful. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.